for inviting me and obviously thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm not even low tech, I'm no tech. Um, so I had the idea that whenever anyone shows a PowerPoint, fairies die, so um, I won't be showing any. Um, however, I will be talking about technology. So the, uh, the title of my talk is Symptoms of Schizo Society. Um, and as a kind of entree to that, I have, uh, fittingly enough, a very short quotation from Bertolt Brecht, who said, don't start from the good old things, but the bad new ones. Um, and then to accompany that, I have a quote from the Canadian uh, social theorist, Marshall McLuhan, who said, we have not yet begun to ask under what new spell we exist. Okay, so... I'm going to read it because uh, if I don't, I'll get lost, but every now and again I will allow myself to get lost. Uh, so the kids of today really are different from the kids of yesterday. You see it everywhere. They all have mobile digital devices of one kind or another in their hands. Um, and I thought this might not be true of India, but I went for a, a bit of a walk yesterday and I see that it's just as true here as it is everywhere else. Whether alone, with their intimates or in groups, the mobile digital device has priority over all other types of social interaction. Uh, even young couples obviously in love now stare at their respective mobile devices rather than into each other's eyes. And it's one of those you know, amazing phenomenons. You see a couple at a restaurant and obviously having a romantic evening and they both have their phone in front of them and they're looking at their phone, not at each other. I wonder if they're looking at pictures of each other on their phone um, and that's probably not impossible either. Uh, as though somehow their souls had migrated out of their bodies and into their phones. This isn't to say the mobile device is antisocial. Far from it. In fact, it has introduced a whole new variety of sociality and indeed a whole new variety of intimacy with it that we're only slowly beginning to understand. Its rules and practices are little understood and for the most part are still being invented. When I was in China maybe 10 years ago, I remember going to a conference um, and I was listening to a, ver a very prestigious speaker and all the way through his talk, uh, mobile phones in the audience were just ringing constantly. But where I was in Australia, if that was happening, that would be deemed rude. But in China, it was not rude to even answer your phone provided you bent over below the level of your seat. So if you were like this, you could talk on your phone as loudly as you wanted, um, and that was fine. Uh, I think what's interesting about the phone is that it's kind of, we, we haven't yet figured out how one uh, integrates this as a social device, okay? So it's, it's technology, but it is a social device, and we're still inventing the social rules of politeness, of how one should proceed uh, with phones. For example, now I, you know, I go to meetings for a department meeting and people just are reading their phone constantly. You've got no idea. They're listening to you. They're talking to you. I mean, you know, what, what is going on? So it's, I'm trying to get my head around that. Frequently satirised in the social media for looking like extras in a zombie apocalypse movie for the peculiar way they shuffle walk everywhere they, with their heads facing down, eyes glued to a screen, the kids of today live a multi-presencing mode of existence that was literally unavailable as recently as a decade ago and utterly unthinkable in the decades prior to that. They are plugged into so many different sources of stimulus, their experience of time and space defies easy description. Not even the science fiction of my own generation of 40-somethings, uh, born at the end of the 1960s, we grew up in Battlestar Galactica, Doctor Who, Star Trek, Star Wars and so on, not even any of those films imagined a world as simultaneously connected, fractured and multiplanar as the one that we know today thanks to digital technology. So all the films of the 1970s and 1980s, those science fiction films, none of them imagined a world as fractured as what we live in today. In fact, it was almost the opposite. They were trying to imagine a world that was unified, that had been brought together by technology. But that does not seem to have happened. And one of the words that I want to pick up on is this idea of connected. We're kind of told that being connected means being brought together. But I want to suggest that it's the opposite. To be connected is to be separated. It's actually the new code word for schizophrenia. Now, as every public speaker knows, lecturing in the 21st century is a highly fraught enterprise. Most people in the audience expect your presentation to be multimedia, 
mine's not. And at the same time, you have to compete with the multimedia devices they have in their hands. Students now will usually have a laptop open in front of them, uh, and if you're lucky, Facebook will be backgrounded, but usually it isn't. Um, and as often as not, they will also have a mobile phone in their hand and they'll be text messaging their friends, you know, this lecture really sucks, what are we doing after this lecture? Uh, and some lecturers even have Twitter feeds behind them so that students can add commentary to what they're saying, this lecture sucks, why is he talking for so long, we should shut up. Um, and, you know, all that's behind you. So this kind of multi-presence uh, is, is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, and some of my students, and I don't know if this is true here as well, but some of my students will also have headphones in. And I'm thinking, what on earth are they listening to? Um, if they're not listening to the lecture, why are they even in the room? Uh, it's just so they can tick a box, you know, their facial recognition software, you were in the room. Um, but, you know, they didn't listen to anything. So in the space of a handful of years, less than the, an evolutionary blink of the eye, the mobile device has gone from being present at hand in Heidegger's sense, I feel obliged in this company to use German references, um, to fully ready to hand, meaning it has passed from being something that is merely of interest, uh, as perhaps an idea or concept might be, to being something that is a practical tool that we use intuitively without conscious thought. Um, if you want to take... Uh, if, you want to, if you're interested in this, Google Park, so that's the Palo Alto Research Centre, okay, which uh, originated um, as a kind of adjacent uh, research centre for Xerox. Uh, and they've got some really fascinating videos that show how in the 1960s they were trying to figure out what intuitive means. And there's this famous video where they get two Nobel scientists who both won um, Nobel Prizes for Physics and ask them to use a photocopier and said, can you photocopy one page and do it double-sided? And between the two of them, they couldn't figure it out. You know, ours, like these two beyond genius type guys, and they had no clue how to work a photocopier. Um, and so that they started to think about, well, what does intuitive mean? How do you create a machine that with no training, you are able to immediately use? But think about what that means. It means that the devices are being moulded to us, but we are also being moulded to our devices. And I'm quite interested in that the closing of that gap, whereby the, the, the machine in our hands is a, is a kind of mirror image of us. Um, just watch babies playing with phones. They kind of catch on to the screen stuff so amazingly quickly, but it's very, very fascinating. This trajectory is, of course, one mapped out for us by designers and manufacturers of digital technology. The great technology uh, revolution in the early 70s when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were just university dropouts, <coughs> Uh, not billionaire gurus, came about because innovators like Gates and Jobs could see that computers had the potential to be machines that people used in their homes in their everyday lives. So the famous part of this story is that IBM knew about computers but couldn't see the point of them, couldn't see that anybody would actually use them in their house, and they just kind of missed the whole thing. So Microsoft came about mostly because IBM didn't have the foresight to see that computers were going to be huge. They thought they were business machines and they'd be back office uh, and that would be it. The prevailing view until then had been that computers were both too complicated and too expensive for anything but commercial, military or geek enthusiast applications. And even then they had no idea just how pervasive digital technology could be and would be once they let the genie out of the bottle. They unleashed a veritable tidal wave of technological innovation that led to the development of the World Wide Web, um, so the internet existed for at least two decades before that, but it wasn't usable. Although the dot-com boom that was supposed to follow this union didn't live up to expectations in the first instance, the cultural changes that it brought about and is still bringing about are uh, seismic in proportion. The web giants Amazon, Facebook and Google belong to this era and we've only scratched the surface in our understanding of how these corporations have transformed the contemporary world. Bear in mind, these are some of the biggest corporations in the world. So Facebook is worth $200 billion. Its market capitalisation is $200 billion. One of the biggest corporations in the world. It only employs 4,000 people. Um, most of us who are on Facebook are actually there by performing free labour for Facebook. All the time we put into making Facebook interesting is what makes Facebook a global corporation. So in other words, we are slaves. We're doing unpaid labour that enriches somebody else. And not only that, we do it willingly. Uh, not only do we use the mobile digital device without thought, um, now, as Heidegger said of Hammers, it has in many ways supplanted thought, thus rendering large parts of our minds redundant. So long as we have Google Maps, we don't need to remember the way home or know how to read a map to figure out to go somewhere. 
Our device can do that for us. Uh, nor do we need to remember to pick up groceries. Our device can remember to do that for us. Or it can enable us to have it home delivered. Similarly, we can program our TVs no matter where we are. And we can connect with friends via social media no matter where they are too. And since practically everyone has a mobile device and not just in the first world, these days we don't even need to concern ourselves with such old-fashioned questions as to whether so-and-so has a phone. Uh, of course they do. So I'm kind of old enough to remember when we would ask people, do you have a phone? Um, and I'm old enough to remember when you would ask somebody if they had a mobile phone. Now these questions have just vanished. We just simply assume that we have a phone. So digital technology is a profound new kind of distraction, one that amplifies all the previously existing distractions that consumer society could throw at us, cinema, magazines, radio, TV and commodities themselves, and effectively forecloses on the possibility of escaping uh, consumer capitalism. There is literally nowhere one can go these days that isn't somehow in the thrall of commodity capitalism. This connectedness, which in its present intensity was impossible, uh, as I said, even a decade ago, comes at a price, uh, albeit one that few of us are complaining about. It is creating a new kind of people, one that as parents whose childhoods were much less connected can and should seem utterly alien, even schizophrenic. Uh, and I will go so far as to say it is schizophrenic, and that schizophrenic is what we mean when we say connected. One can only imagine what the people to come, which is a Deleuze phrase, uh, will be like. Now, phone companies and dot-com boosters tell us that our device is our means of reaching the world. The reality is, of course, the other way around. It is their means of reaching us. Our screens are their billboards. But unlike the old-fashioned static billboards blighting the streets and highways, our smartphones aren't random. They don't just flash random images at us. They're programmed to deliver advertisements and suggestions that reflect our carefully data-tracked habits. If we use our phones or laptops to look at real estate or new cars, for example, then every time we open Facebook or a news aggregator site, we'll be shown more advertisements for houses and cars. Not only that, the next time we search for something else, our search engine will prompt us to look at real estate and cars first. If we check in at a cafe, our phone will tell us what else is around and suggest shops that we might like to visit uh, on the basis of our past searches and activities. It is all presented as though it is a free service and added convenience and not simply a lure for our attention. Concerns about our personal privacy and the tracking and trafficking of our data is waved away by us as much as by the data miners themselves as so much paranoia. There has been no device in the history of technology more efficient than the smartphone when it comes to capturing our attention. Um, there's a very interesting book around the history of attention um, that spans uh, a century. And a century ago, the, there was a lot of anxiety um, that people were being forced to spend too much time and they were being too attentive to things and that they needed to take more breaks and have a holiday. By the middle of the 20th century, the anxiety had swung the reverse way, which was that people weren't capable of paying attention, and therefore they needed to take drugs in order to be able to, take, to pay attention. So you have a whole generation of children on Ritalin um, in order so they can pay attention to calm them down so that they're not constantly flighty. Uh, and now we're in this sort of new zone where people are engaging in practices that are variously known as mindfulness in order to try to switch off from paying attention to too many things. So there's a very interesting history of attention to be written uh, about the present moment, that we are being bombarded by stimulus, and a lot of it we don't really know what to do with, um, and we don't know how to process it. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in, which I think is kind of at the heart of what schizoanalysis is about, is how do we process all these messages that we're constantly receiving. And if you were to kind of keep like a message diary, write down every time you were prompted by a machine or by a billboard or someone or something to buy something, to think about a commodity and so forth, you would be astonished at just how much messaging you were receiving all the time. So the question is, how does one process that? What does one do with that? And, and it's this idea of attention and, and the capture of attention that the phone has been absolutely sublime uh, at, and that's what I want to think about. So much so it has made time itself 
unbearable. So I guess what I'm trying to say then is that the idea of the capture of attention, one of the effects of that has made it seem uh, unbearable not to have your attention captured. So we, there's another, whilst we're quoting Germans, there's a, Krakauer has a very fantastic uh, essay on boredom where he says that the problem with the 20th century is that it doesn't give us time to be bored when it really deserves boredom. That in fact, it is a profoundly boring kind of place and it deserves our boredom, but we don't get time to be bored by it. And I think one could say that's what the mobile phone does. It means that you can never be bored and you can never have that boredom as a proper response to the boringness of consumer capitalism. So the phone makes time itself seem unbearable in its absence. One can hardly imagine waiting for a bus or a plane or a coffee without the distraction of one's phone. It's as if seconds and minutes stretch into hours and days when not contained by a digital device of some kind. Adults and children, young and old, men and women, are all equally afflicted. No one sits and contemplates the world anymore. Our eyes are glued to our screens, checking email, checking in with our social media or watching a video. It no longer seems rude or impolite to check one's phone when talking to someone else. Unmediated time, or what we might dare to call pure time, because it is time experienced without the mediation of a digital device, is steadily vanishing from our lives. And let's not kid ourselves, this has been the goal of every new piece of information technology since the invention of writing. As Frederick Jameson argued more than two decades ago, the final frontier of capitalism was always consciousness itself, and that moment has arrived. Locked in the gilded cage of our connectedness, we are unaware of how thoroughly colonised our conscious mind is. Indeed, we're unlikely to think that our mind is colonised, Firstly, this is because we see ourselves as masters of our devices. Our devices work for us, or so we like to believe. But actually, as Marshall McLuhan said in 1964, we're just the sex organs of the machine world, as the bee of the plant world, enabling it to fecundate and to evolve ever new forms. The machine world reciprocates man's love by expediting his desires and wishes. But I would argue McLuhan doesn't go far enough because the debate whether we use technology or it uses us still assumes that we are autonomous subjects and that is far from the case. This is the second way we deceive ourselves. Advertising flatters us into thinking we are constantly telling us, by constantly telling us we have choices, that we are individuals, that we are separate. Whether or not these devices are actually changing people and if so, in what way? My principal thesis, as I said, is that we are connected, but that doesn't mean we are a people. There is no commons and no multitude. So one of the things I would want to reject is uh, Hart and Negri's idea of the multitude. I think it's a wonderful fantasy, but I don't see any evidence of it. And I think that a lot of what is happening with digital technology is where they saw it in a utopian way as bringing the people together because you know revolutionaries were using mobile phones to connect each other. If that revolutionary spirit ever existed, I think it has been captured. I think that it has been commodified, that Facebook and social media have figured out that there was a way to commodify that revolutionary spirit and give us all the appearance that every time I click like on an image that shows a right on revolutionary spirit, I can click like on it and I'm done. You know, my revolutionary spirit for the day has been expelled and I can feel good about myself, but change nothing, right? And that's the point. Uh, so much so that a new category needs to be added to David Reisman's History and Typology of Social Character, The Lonely Crowd. If you haven't read this book, you really should. It's an absolute masterpiece. Um, it kind of uh, sort of fell out of circulation. It sold millions of copies in the 1960s and then I think it kind of became old-fashioned and people stopped reading it. But you should go back and read it. It's astonishingly prescient. He really had an amazing sense of what postmodern life was going to look like as early as 1960. Um, I just can't believe how good it is. Um, today's youth are neither inner-directed or other-directed. These were Reisman's phrases. Um, they're connected. So the inner-directed is what he refers to as traditional society whereby your life's goals and, and your kind of sense of yourself comes from within. Other-directed means that your sense of yourself comes from without. Uh, and he, what he saw in the 60s was a shift towards the sense that people's goals their ambitions for their life were coming from without, not from themselves, but from outside of themselves, from, from marketing, from capitalism and so on. 
Uh, and I think we've moved into a, a new generation of that that's gone beyond other directed to this sort of notion of connected, which is sort of making us seem that we are in a directed all over again, but it's coming from the outside. And so a new structure of conformity, this is Reisman's phrase, uh, and with it a new type of social character has emerged in the past couple of decades. And even though most of us are aware of it, its contours have yet to be mapped. In large part, this is because we haven't wanted to admit to ourselves that we have changed along with our technology. We want to see ourselves as users of new technology, regardless of whether we're digital natives or digital immigrants, to use this fashionable but basically meaningless historical divide. Not only that, we want to think that using new technology doesn't change us. I'm still the same, I have a phone that I haven't changed. Um, it's, merely how we, it's merely changed how we do things. And this is false, and false for two reasons. Um, sorry, I'll say it again. This is false on at least two levels. That this is false on at least two levels is strikingly obvious, but no one is talking about it. And perhaps this is because we're afraid to break the spell we're under and admit that being connected isn't as innately desirable as we tell ourselves it is. So one of the, the great myths of our time is that to be connected is intrinsically a good thing. Okay? Uh, and so one of the things I'd want to say is, well, why? And what does it mean to be connected? And in what way is that intrinsically good? What are the benefits? Who benefits? We tend to think of conformity as inherently bad, but that was not, all, not at all Reisman's view, as it, uh, often it pains to point out. In some senses, conformity is a social necessity, which is precisely how Reisman himself viewed it. His concept of social character is derived from, uh, yet another German, uh, Eric Fromm's idea that individual members of a society, and I'm quoting from here, have to desire what objectively is necessary for them to do. And in doing so, they convert an external force into an internal compulsion. Uh, that's the sense in which they become directed. Society's task, therefore, is to ensure some degree of conformity in all individuals who make up that society. Reisman's assumption is that conformity is built into the child and then either encouraged or frustrated in later adult experience. He also proposed that alongside the mode of conformity, there is a mode of creativity, uh, but suggests that while society cannot live without the former, it can live without the latter. Now, this is the part where Deleuzeans would profoundly disagree, I'm sure. Uh, Reisman saying, we have to have conformity or we can't have society. We should have creativity, but we can live without it. Uh, I imagine that the Deleuze would probably say something that's slightly the, the reverse of that, that we have to have creativity, maybe we can't, you know, maybe we can live without conformity. Um, one of the things that's interesting to try to figure out with Deleuze is where he does think about conformity, where, where, he, where his position on that is, because he's not... Uh, a sort of 100% pure anarchist, everything should be chaos. So at some point, there must be a sense by which he's saying there needs to be some model or understanding of conformity, but he's extremely vague on that particular issue. Uh, and now this is a basic evolutionary model. Society tends to produce itself until it doesn't because of some kind of accident which brings about unintended change in the structure. Uh, even revolutions are a kind of accident to begin with because we never really know how they're going to turn out. Now, for Reisman, conformity must be desired, not coerced. But, and this is the interesting question, that desire can be manufactured. Uh, however, it is manufactured in such a way that we never realise it. In other words, it's not a matter of persuasion or even delusion. Okay, so this is... For me, this is the heart and soul of schizoanalysis. How do we come to desire something if that desire is manufactured? How do we talk about that desire as being our own desire if that desire is manufactured elsewhere? But if we are not able to see that that desire was manufactured elsewhere, then how do we talk about it? Whose desire is it? So one of the really interesting ideas that Deleuze and Guattari propose is a model that suggests that there are individual desire and collective desire. Collective desire is not the desire of the masses, but rather desires that come from the outside that we have embodied and adopted for ourselves without ever knowing that they didn't come from us. Okay? And that's what makes them, in a sense, invisible to us. They always seem like our desire. And so as we try to negotiate and think about how to transform desire, we have to try to figure out where these desires came from. 
Now, one of the other things that I'm trying to get at here is that technology is inherently social. So that in thinking about technology, we have to think about it as a form of desire, that it relies on and produces models of desire. Technology has to be desired collectively for it to be taken up at all. Uh, and this is not simply a matter of economics, although that is obviously not irrelevant. Advertising is a daily reminder that a thing, whether that thing is a commodity or a political idea, has to be socially desirable before it can be individually desired. So one of the other points that I was making about the phone, the way it's been integrated socially, is that it has to be made socially desirable. We had to figure out how to integrate the phone into society. And it's quite interesting if you go back and look at the history of the phone, that there was a lot of resistance to the phone. I mean, you can barely believe it now because everybody has one. Um, but if you go back to the early uh, 1980s when mobile phones first started to be uh, circulated, if you had a mobile phone, people thought you were some sort of, um, you know, kind of y yuppie or bourgeoisie or something like that. And there was a lot of criticism of people had, who had mobile phones. But nonetheless, they became desirable objects over time. And we've sort of forgotten that history of the object, forgotten the way by which it became integrated. And thereby we've forgotten that there was a kind of resistance, that there was a moment when we could have turned our backs on the phone and said, no, we don't want it, we don't need it. Uh, and now we can't imagine life without it. So advertising works to create the social conditions under which a particular thing will be broadly accepted as normal, however strange it might first appear. In other words, it seeks to change us in order to make us receptive to its products. So one of the failures of media studies in the first iteration of it was to think that what advertising was trying to do was to make products desirable. But I think this is a mistake. What advertising does is make the whole idea of commodity capitalism socially acceptable. And that's why we now have a celebrity culture, a culture in which brand names are powerful and so on, because advertising worked to change culture itself. It didn't simply focus on objects, it focused on the very desirability of consumer culture. It made it seem not merely desirable to own that object, but rather desirable to be part of a culture in which that object was a status symbol. Okay? So referring to our current generation as a digital natives barely scratches the surface because the cultural change that have occurred since Reisman first wrote about the emergence of an other-directed generation run much deeper than that. Technology is an essential part of the story, but it isn't the whole story because it doesn't explain why the technology has become ubiquitous. It is doubtful that anyone, not even the inventors themselves, dreamt they'd be spending all day staring at screens when personal computers first became available. Yet this is what has happened. We are enthralled to our machines without really knowing why or how they managed to capture our attention so fully and so completely. But the machines are mere enablers they're important to be sure, but they're cogs in a system that hides in plain sight. Now this is what McLuhan was referring to over 50 years ago when he said we don't know under what new spell we exist. Internet enabled mobile devices have put the world in our pocket, or so the marketers would have us believe. And in doing so they have obscured the true nature of the world. Social theorists like Jean, uh, Jean Baudrillard saw this happening in the 1970s. Baudrillard theorised that the media in all its forms had combined to create an entirely uh, new form of sensorium, which he called the simulacra. Like McLuhan before him, Baudrillard insisted that it isn't the content of media that is especially new in an, an, in a, an historical sense. It is rather the form that is new. The shift from print-based media to visual media, particularly digital media, has changed everything. In Baudrillard's view, a vast process of simulation is taking place in which models of things, indeed models for and of life itself, are being substituted for the things themselves so that ultimately one might say, today, life is lived in a simulator. Now, Baudrillard is generally read as talking about sort of semiotics, but really what he was talking about is social character. Or rather, he was lifting the veil on social character that was forming in this period that hadn't really come into full fruition and didn't do so until uh, mobile phones and digital technology became as widely available as it did. Now, one of the other things that I want to suggest then is that in thinking about contemporary media, contemporary advertising, contemporary technology, uh, I want to sort of propose the idea that there is 
no I that encounters advertising. So one of the myths of advertising is that advertising is directed to me, to I, to us. Um, I want to suggest rather, and here I'm kind of picking up on Deleuze and Guattari, that the I is a product of advertising. So the I that I talk about isn't what is addressed by advertising, it is produced by advertising. Until now we have tended to think about this in terms of identification and interpolation as though I existed but I've identified with the commodity. I want to take it further and say actually no, I am the reflection of that commodity. And I want to suggest that those earlier theories of Althusser and Lacan do not go far enough. We need to think in terms of formation and deformation. We are made in the image capitalism requires. But the interesting thing about that is that capitalism does not want us to settle into that identity, so it constantly unsettles us. We think we're reading media texts and we congratulate ourselves on our ability to decode the more sophisticated pieces we encounter. But in so doing, we overlook the basic fact that their sole purpose is, and this is something that Reisman was saying 50 years ago, to tutor us in the art of consumption. Therefore, everything we see on screen, in magazines and and newspapers, we hear on radio and so forth, regardless of its apparent genre, is in fact an advertisement. Uh, And this is what McLuhan was also saying. He said, films are the best possible advertisements there are because irrespective of what the story is, the whole time you're looking at it, you're entering into a world that's a fantasy world. It's a world that was constructed and makes commodity capitalism look desirable. Now, as Deleuze and Guattari have argued, capitalism produces the subjects it requires. We are, in fact, avatars of the system we think we created. Digital technology isn't the problem, then, Digital technology isn't really even my target here. There have been, and there will continue to be, endless kind of Jeremiah's uh, written bemoaning the deleterious effects of digital technology in all its manifestations, from the smartphone to the automated factory to the call centre and so on. But this mistakes the, the means for the cause. I don't disagree with those theorists like Marshall McLuhan who argue that new technology has uh, particular kinds of social and cultural effects that can be identified and mapped. But I do disagree that these effects can be considered in isolation from larger social processes, particularly the mode of production. The true cause of the various travails these uh, commentaries remark upon is capitalism itself. Digital technology is merely capitalism's latest and most efficient means of achieving its ends, namely the perpetuation of itself as a mode of uh, production and a corresponding distribution of wealth to the fortunate few. So capitalism distributes privilege, right? And that's what it wants to maintain and it's looking for new ways of maintaining that. And we have to remember that, that every time we pick up a a smartphone and so forth, we are part of that process. The smartphone wants to capture our attention because phone manufacturers want us to buy one. They want us to buy their product and they want us to upgrade it regularly. Telecommunications carriers want us to sign up for network carriage and upgrade our packages regularly. Online businesses want us to visit their sites and purchase products from them. Offline businesses want us to be prompted by their advertisements to purchase their products. Social media and news aggregator sites want us to visit their sites so they can sell advertising space to online and offline retailers. Software companies want us to sell operating systems to manufacturers and track our data and sell that to marketing companies. Marketing firms make cute little cat videos and memes to capture our data so that they can sell that to social media sites Uh, and so on, which they then run through algorithms and sell them to retailers. And doubtless there are other commercial imperatives underpinning the existence of the smartphone that I'm not aware of and not quite paranoid enough to think of. Um, But my point is that the convenience of the machine is merely a lure that entrances us into tethering ourselves willingly, avidly even, to a vast commercial enterprise that spans the width of the world. There is nowhere we can go to escape it so long as we have this clever little device in our pocket. About 20 years ago, Coca-Cola stated that its global ambition was that there would be a can of Coke no more than two metres away from every person on the planet. Now, that sounds hideous, but think about a mobile phone. How close is a mobile phone? It's not two metres, it's in your pocket. The global ambition of the mobile phone is that you would never be anywhere without it. Uh, And the next generation of mobile phones are not even going to require a device in your pocket, you're just going to wear a wristwatch and you'll be able to read it on a screen in front of you with a heads-up display and so forth. So two metres seems like so five minutes ago how unambitious were Coca-Cola that they wanted that that you can to be two metres away. With Now with the technological devices, it's going to become part of your body. The next version will be you'll just simply have it implanted and you won't even need to go and 
get a device and carry it around because it will be part of your body. Um, and I don't think we're really kind of caught up with just what a transformation that is and just what an invasion that is and how much we have been captured by capitalism without really knowing it. It's constantly sold to us as convenience. Um, and we are willing and avidly going down this pathway. So the final form of the commodity is the image, as de Boer predicted, precisely because in the image the commodity ceases to be visible as a commodity. At the moment of its greatest visibility, it disappears. Everyone has a phone and we've stopped seeing that we have a commodity. Now, schizophrenic is a bold choice of word for this state of affairs, and I certainly don't use it lightly, but I think it's not without foundation. Behaviour that passes for normal today is in many cases indistinguishable from the key clinical symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, for example, we listen to the disembodied voices of advertisements all day long and happily do as they instruct. We buy this, we buy that, we think this, we think that, without questioning how weird this really is. So they used to lock people up for hearing voices. Um, now, now that's perfectly normal. I'll never forget the first time I saw somebody using a cell phone with just like the, the earpiece and they're sort of walking around an airport talking to themselves. I thought, what the fuck? What's this person? <laughs> completely lost it. Uh, and then I realised that they had a cell phone. And now, if you see someone talking to themselves walking down the street, your first thought isn't quick, you know, call the loony bin. It's, you know, it's become absolutely normal. So our digital devices bombard us with message and stimuli and we think nothing about it. But the reality, uh, as research is beginning to show, is that it is transforming us individually, culturally and socially, in ways that we haven't mapped. Thus, ours is a schizo society. Now, I'm very far from the first to suggest that contemporary society can be usefully thought uh, in terms of schizophrenia. Baudrillard, Deleuze, Guattari and Jameson have all made the same suggestion. Uh, although their respective accounts differ in the details, they all agree on one point. It is capitalism that is schizophrenizing. Their message, however, has fallen on deaf ears. The kids of today want to think of their connectedness as empowering. They want to believe they really do have the world in their pocket. They don't want to hear that the magical device is enslaving. Not even when the overworked executives who know for, certain, know for a certain fact that their life is dominated by their mobile devices want to hear this. Uh, in part, this is because, uh, as others have argued, they want to be dominated by their jobs. Uh, but also, in a much more problematic way, because capitalism has convinced us that we have agency despite all the evidence to the contrary. Cultural critics who sing this song, that popular culture and all its new devices and toys are liberating, are simply singing from capitalism's hymn sheet. Um, I've never kind of understood the idea that you often hear in sort of cultural studies that, you know, young girls watching Buffy and then going out and thinking that they are Buffy is empowering. Uh, I don't kind of buy that for a second. And when you, you know, hear young kids say, oh, well, I you know, watched an episode of Buffy and then I hacked it and cut it up and made my own version of Buffy so it's, you know, it's all about me, I don't think that's empowering either. It might be creative, but it's not empowering. It hasn't changed their social position in the world. So I think we need to be pretty careful about what we think of and understand by the idea of empowering. Simply making a video is not empowering. It may be creative, but it hasn't changed your social reality. Um, sadly, though, they don't seem to have the sense to realise that when the critics scold iconoclasts like Adorno and Horkheimer, some more Germans, um, for being gloomy about contemporary existence, they are simply doing capitalism's work. So schizo symptoms, I want to suggest, are like barometers. Their perception of the world, they are a perception of the world which we want to see uh, as diseased and distorted. And that offers an acute truth if only we allow ourselves to see it. For example, Renee, the schizophrenic girl in Marguerite Seshahay's case history, autobiography of a schizophrenic girl, reports that she received orders to do things from what she called the system. She is eventually hospitalised for carrying out an order to burn her own right hand. From that angle, it looks like the manifestation of a diseased mind. But if we step back, we can see that our own lives are similarly saturated by demands for action. This way of thinking about the culture industry, as Adorno and Horkheimer strikingly called it, has become very unfashionable. Nowadays, we tend to speak of consumers as being empowered. But this is precisely what capitalism wants. As Marshall McLuhan says, advertising constantly urges us to overestimate our own agency. 
In this respect, the paranoid worldview of the schizo actually seems a lot closer to reality. Now, there are, of course, multiple definitions of schizophrenia, and I would draw on several of them, um, but I want to use Gregory Bateson's work on schizophrenia, uh, and not the stuff on the double bind, I might add, to frame this. Uh, in particular, I want to focus on his insight that in most cases, schizophrenia as an illness manifests itself as the loss of the capacity for what he calls meta-communication. Namely, the ability to communicate about communication, to comment upon the meaningful actions of oneself and others. And there are other symptoms, but I just want to look at this one for the moment. Um, because what's important about the idea of metacommunication is, in a sense, what he's saying is metacommunication is you receive signals that you are able to process and then relate back and say, this is what it means to me. This is what that signal meant to me. Uh, and one of the things I want to suggest is that the problem with contemporary society is that the majority of messages that we receive, we don't know how to process. Um, so, for example, Daniel Borstein's book, The Image, which again came out in the early 1960s, one of the things that he argues there, which I think uh, is, is, is profoundly true, he says that we've moved beyond a realm of truth and fact. So when you see an advertisement, we don't judge that advertisement according to measures of either truth or fact. So, for example, I was at a supermarket recently uh, looking to get myself some breakfast cereal, and, and there was a box of breakfast cereal that claimed that it was life-changing muesli. <laughs> And, you know, I really wanted to get that box and straight away thought, life-changing music, that's really what I need right now. Um, but how does one evaluate that? I mean, in what sense will my life be changed by buying a box of music? But we don't even make that evaluation. We don't go along and say, yeah, I don't believe this. It's not going to change my life and therefore not buy it. We kind of buy into that, but we don't evaluate it either from the perspective of truth or from the perspective of fact. So that is what um, Bateson is talking about in terms of metacommunication. Meta how do I relate to that? What sense of that claim do I possibly make? In what semiotic realm does that claim make sense to me? Uh, so what I'm suggesting is that we live in a schizophrenic society because almost all the messages we encounter belong to that domain of beyond truth and fact and therefore require from us another kind of semiotic regime to try to make sense of. Now I realise I've probably been talking way too long so I'm going to conclude then by giving you a, a summary list of the four main symptoms of schizo uh, society. Um, I propose these only so we can argue about them. They shouldn't be seen as exhaustive or definitive or without the possibility of emendation or transformation, as I said, they're for us to argue about. So, the four symptoms of schizo society. The first, there has been a profound decentering of the eye. We can no longer totalise or control the competing subjectivities or voices in our heads. Wants have become needs, and needs have become optional. Uh, so for me, the, the most standout example of this is the idea of climate change. We all know that the planet is facing catastrophic uh, consequences if we don't change what we do, but we don't change what we do. We know it, but we do nothing. I don't think this means that we are cynical, which is sort of the discourse that Zizek and others have tried to raise over the last decade or so. I think it, it runs a lot deeper than that. We simply don't know how to proceed uh, in this uh, instance. Second, we have an inability to distinguish between the merely apparent and the actual. Or rather, the virtual is the actual in our heads. Uh, there is a triumph of the surface and of the superficial. The apparent is all there is. Hence the success of IKEA as a model of furniture. Uh, I assume you have IKEA here, it's a global virus. If you don't have IKEA, well it's lucky. IKEA is kind of... <laughs> IKEA takes a photograph of furniture and then glues it to cardboard, um, and that's what its furniture is. So it, it it's only looks like furniture, it isn't actually furniture. Um, but you do have shopping malls, because I went to one. Um, although your shopping mall here is, has gun emplacements around it, trying to keep the consumers out. That's not the model we have in Australia. We have, I think, guns behind people pushing them in. Um, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, it looks exactly the same when I went inside. Uh, and of course, there is Disneyland. Um, but perhaps the, the most interesting one for me is that there is a kind of, the idea of uh, deep knowledge is being kind of data mined out of indigenous culture and, and marketed back to us as the cure for our uh, superficiality. There is, as I've suggested before, a loss of metacommunication. Meta we are unable to stop the voices and demands. We are helpless against them. We don't know what to do about them. Uh, and this manifests itself as a loss of impulse, impulse control and an intense fascination 
with its kind of apparent polar opposite in terms of uh, mindfulness and spirituality uh, as a kind of refuge from the hyperstimulation. Uh, and lastly, self-destruction seems both rational and attractive. And it manifests itself as overeating, as drug abuse, sedentariness, war, climate change, uh, and so on. And so my last point then, in the realm of schizoanalysis, contrary to psychoanalysis, the truth does not set us free. Exposing falsehoods doesn't seem to change anything. It's no longer revolutionary. We know that many things to be false, and yet it makes no difference. Uh, I was talking to Leon in the, uh, in the car on the way over here and talking about an example in Belfast recently where Belfast in Ireland, kind of a, a bankrupt state, they were having a heads of government uh, meeting there. They didn't want to you know, be obviously bankrupt. So they took down all the boards in front of the shops. They put up pictures in the shop windows so that they would look like shops. So it was like a movie set. Um, and, and the cars could all drive through and it looked like it was a vibrant community, but of course they were just photographs. But what was really interesting about this, it wasn't a secret. It was reported in the media that this is what they were doing. So you couldn't go, aha, I've exposed the truth of this. It's just a photograph, it's not real. Everybody knew it wasn't real. Appearance was sufficient. That is schizophrenia. That is what I'm talking about with schizoanalysis. Thank you very much. What is your understanding of agency and if there is any scope for that? Um, it, and, and perhaps you're speaking of some thin notions of agency where people look for comfort, etc. and perhaps thicker notions where <coughs> struggle and revolution is the only agent should act. We want neither your problems nor your solutions. We want something else. Um, so agency, I don't think, resists, re kind of resides in the idea of the I, because the I itself is an avatar of, of capitalism and, and something that we've been persuaded to think for ourselves. Uh, I think it would reside somewhere deeper, uh, as I said, in, in a sort of visceral idea of disgust. Yes. Yeah. Uh, should there be uh, any uh, more and more uh, uh, skeptical of, should we be more and more skeptical of beautiful things and how the uh, definition of beauty constantly uh, kind, of, kind of consumes other things. Like if you say this is anti-beauty and after some time that will also be another kind of beauty. So this question is coming because I was recently in Calcutta and uh, I don't know whether the political situation, I don't know whether you are aware of the political situation there. Uh, but the thing is, uh, but when you look around, there is a, uh, the government is in like very uh, shaky uh, grounds. But if you look around, like all the effort of the government is in being beautifying the place. I mean, everything is being uh, done extra hard, uh, painting things and cleaning things and pruning the gardens and it kind of seemed perverse to me. But if somebody is just coming to Calcutta for a visit, it will be to look so nice. I'm sure it's not like the first government was trying to do that. But that, but when I thought about that and listened to you, I was thinking like, should we be more and more uh, uh, skeptical about beautiful things and and the power it has over us and how the definition of beauty constantly keeps changing and takes into its hold a lot of ugly things and so on. Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, obviously that goes back to the idea of the Potemkin village, um, which is uh, how the... Um, so the Potemkin village is pre-revolutionary Russia where the, um, they didn't want to tell the Tsar that things were really... They didn't want the Tsar to realise that things were just going to hell um, out in the amongst the people as it were. So they created a model village and they showed him around the village and the village looked fine so he thought everything was awesome uh, and carried on doing what he's doing. So this model, you know, this idea has existed for a long time. Um, you know, in aesthetic terms, uh, obviously uh, going right back to Kant, um, the difference between the beautiful and the sublime was that the, the beautiful didn't require much effort on our part, but the sublime was shattering um, and you weren't able to hold on to all your old ideas of things. Um, so my sense is that, yes, we do need more sublime things that shatter our illusions. But I think what's interesting, uh, part of what I was trying to claim is that even when we know the truth, we still don't know how to act. 
Um, so, for example, I was reading recently about the current state of the oceans. Within the last five years, 70% of all coral died. I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, like, I don't know what to, how to even process that fact. Um, so I know the truth, I know the facts, but I don't know what to do with that. I don't eat fish, so I'm not contributing to this global you know, disintegration of fish um, by eating them, but I am in other ways through my lifestyle. Uh, so yes, we, want, we need somehow to be able to puncture the veil, but simply finding the truth about things isn't enough. Uh, I guess what schizoanalysis is trying to say is that you need to find the truth of yourself and to understand how you are formed and to try to think, well, why am I content with this thing? Why does this you know, beautiful thing, this cat video, why does it kind of make me feel calm and happy? And, and you know, what is the nature of my desire? Why do I find commodities desirable? You know, where does that come from? And, and to try to question and challenge that. But yes, beginning with you know, overturning the idea of the beautiful as being something that should make you um, politically passive is, is clearly a very important place to start. Hi, um, really enjoyed what you were saying. Um, I was just thinking whether we could look at, uh, like, I, um, the thought that popped in my head was, um, can we, in a way, schizoanalyze um, law? Because uh, um, law in liberal democracies is supposed to be this um, very important mechanism of, let's say, control or something like that. And uh, when, like you said, uh, there is a schizo society and there is a big debate in the law of what is rational and what is mad. And when a human being is considered to be insane, mad or uh, incapable of having his own thing, then you cannot have law passed that so whatever thing. So when there is a schizo, can we schizo analyze law because um, I'm just going back to this thing about uh, you know, like the Kojido of Fuku in Derida and how, what are your thoughts on that? I'd just like to ask. Yeah, look, it's a great question. Um, Deleuze certainly says that our focus should be on jurisprudence, that how our law is constructed um, and what are the basis of laws. And, and as you point out, the idea of the rational person is one of the sort of founding ideas of a lot of uh, legal production. Uh, so certainly challenging that idea um, is important. Uh, Deleuze is quite interesting because he rejects the idea of rights as being the way forward um, and focuses more on justice and, make, and sort of makes the claim that justice is something that has to do with a, with a kind of sense of collective being, that there cannot be justice while there is inequality, that there cannot be justice while people are living in poverty and other people are living a life of you know, ridiculous luxury, that there can be no justice. So justice before law and justice before rights. Uh, and he also doesn't necessarily look to the law in order to bring about justice. In other words, you know, it's possible to have justice even if you don't have uh, laws to enact it. Uh, so I think that that's a kind of would be the sort of Deleuzean way of approach here, and I suppose that would be my own way of doing it. But I would also think that, you know, in some cases the law is a possible way to begin to seek justice, that the law <coughs> offers a moment for you to try to turn the system against itself, you know, for the snake to bite its own tail. Not always possible, um, but say in Australia, for example, where the Indigenous people have begun to try to extract the idea of land rights out of the Australian legal system, um, by finding the contradictions within the system, um, that has been an important step, but by no means definitive. You know, it's not the case that Indigenous people now have a fabulous existence. There has not yet been justice, um, but they don't seem to have. There seems to be no other recourse for them, so they are making use of that. So I certainly would agree that you, know, you have to try to transform the law if you can, um, but that, that's not where you will find justice, and justice shouldn't be thought in legal terms. I want to ask you um, how you, um, in what way do you think the mobile phone is different from the book? Um, would the world of books prior to the arrival of mobile phone 
lend itself to schizoanalysis in the same way in which you are looking at digital technology. So how, how would we conceptualize the difference between the book and the mobile? Yeah, it's a really interesting question whether or not there has been um, a category shift between print culture and digital culture. Uh, Marshall McLuhan didn't really think that there had been, that he thought just things had accelerated, that, you know, that what print culture set in motion, digital culture has simply accelerated. So it's the same kind of thing, but now happening at a much, much faster rate. Um, I think that's partly true, uh, but what the mobile phone has also done has, is to bring to a whole new level visual culture, so that you know, words are becoming redundant. In lots of ways. So when you look at Facebook, you're actually looking at pictures, not so much the words. Um, so we kind of need a whole new form of semiotics to deal with this kind of visual culture production that is different from print culture. Um, the other thing about print culture was that print culture introduced uh, vast kinds of standardisation that we're, that we're not really aware of. Um, you may not know this, it's a kind of interesting story, but the so-called, do you know this, the English accent, what we think of as the English accent receiving, do you know why it was, you know it's invented, right? The English accent is an invention of the 1850s, and do you know why they invented it? So that when they sent people out to India to tell Indian people what to do, you could understand them. Um, because, you know, Indian people could speak English, but they couldn't understand what the fuck someone with a Scottish accent was saying, or an Irish accent, like, what are they talking about? So... The English themselves had to invent the English accent in order to come out and rule the people of India. Um, so what's happening is there's these vast processes of standardisation that appear cultural, but in fact happen for reasons to do with power, for capitalism, for marketing reasons. Uh, and a lot of what's happening with Facebook and so forth is massive standardisation happening behind that. That, that we can't even begin to see. So it's about trying to open up that black box and say, well, you know, what is happening? Um, and the data tracking of that is phenomenal. The other thing that you don't, perhaps don't know that you're doing, so Facebook is beta testing. So beta testing means you come up with a computer program and then you put it out in the world to see if it works and people use it and they come back and you say, yeah, we need to do this, that and the other. So Facebook is beta testing facial recognition software for military surveillance purposes. So every time you click on a photo and say, yes, this is me, you are confirming the algorithm's ability to recognise a face. So on a global scale of like a billion people, we are helping this surveillance machine develop and refine its technology. So we're, you know, we're contributing to our own control. And this is what Deleuze and Guattari talk about, the idea of a control society. But what's really interesting is that we don't know, and when we do know, we don't care. So I found myself um, constantly uh, replacing the word religion in the middle of the lecture, and I found it held true for so much of what you said about technology and advertising, when you put it to the truth and fact test, or when you say it's talking to you, yeah. and it gives you a sense of I, and to I. And um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, when we talk religion and technology, do you think if we bring in words like faith or belief, or the need for what I call the sacred canopy, based on what you're saying, uh, that this generation needs something to believe in, and somehow this social media and things have given them something they can actually believe in, which makes sense to them? Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, Weber thought that, um, so it's because we're in a German institute, I'm just quoting all these German sociologists. Um, but, Weber thought that with Protestantism, the thing that happened with Protestantism is that the Protestants said that God was everywhere. And so because God was everywhere, you didn't actually need to go to the church on Sunday because God was with you all the time. And so when you were making money, you must be doing God's work. Uh, and so eventually, the Protestants turned us all into secularists because we no longer needed to go to church and making money was good. So therefore, making money was godly. Therefore, we didn't even need to be godly anymore because we were just making money. Um, and so there, there was a kind of a collapse of the distinction between making money and believing in God. Um, and so that's what sort of happened within a Christian culture, uh, such that we don't, in a sense, need God anymore. And there's a, a, a you know, brilliant book by um, Tom Frank called One Market Under God. Um, within, within sort of different contexts, 
That question of belief and how belief works is actually a really important question and a really powerful question. Deleuze and Guattari theorise that there are only sort of two flows. There are flows of desire and flows of belief. And that, that the flows of belief kind of work to bring a stop to the flows of desire. They're kind of an anti-productive force. So that desire is productive, belief is anti-productive. Um, and that there is some kind of a balance that is needed. If we're just constantly producing, if we're constantly desiring, um, then we have an experiment on the phone during the answer. Um, so, so the religion then functions as a kind of necessary counterbalance. So I don't know if people need to believe, but certainly I think that there is a dimension whereby they want to believe in a sort of classic X-Files fashion. Um, they want to believe because believing enables them to bring desiring to a satisfying hold. But if you're constantly desiring, it's a, it's a kind of agitation that you can't deal with. And belief balances that. So whether or not they believe in anything is not important. The process of believing seems to be important. Which is why people can believe in the X-Files or Buffy or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your introduction. I would like to ask if you see a role for mindfulness in the, in, in the digital culture that we have, that we have today. I mean, we talk about schizophrenia. Uh, is there a role for mindfulness? In, 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 this, in this, this area? Or is there a role for people to be more mindful of the way they, they, they behave, the way the social entities have been, have been spread across various websites? Is there, is there a role that you see? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I don't have a, a particular kind of answer because partly um, what we think of as mindfulness, certainly within an Australian <laughs> or American context, is a reaction to the massive stimulation of consumer capitalism. So whether it's you know, genuine mindfulness of the kind that might have existed before capitalism, I have no idea. Uh, whether it's possible to get back to anything like that, I'm highly sceptical of. Um, but I also wonder whether or not it's not also a kind of an illusion, um, and it may be a beautiful illusion, and I and certainly don't denigrate anybody who would pursue it. Um, but I guess the question for me is, how does mindfulness operate within a larger context of consumer capitalism? So my sense would be that most versions of mindfulness are simply commodifications of experience and, and another way of capturing and selling time. But what's really beautiful about it is it's, it's the most extreme form of capitalism, which is to sell something you didn't own in the first place. So when you sell someone mindfulness, you don't own their mind, but you're selling it back to them. Uh, that's the most extreme form of capitalism, and that's kind of what's bringing the planet to, the, to its knees, right? So I think we should be sceptical of it. There's one thing that comes to my mind. Guns don't kill people. People do. I don't think technology is the one to blame here, and I think it's people who have the responsibility to shut everything out of the age, so choose. I think the purpose of technology is actually to enhance and create that technology and capitalism is to enhance and create value. And it, it is our choice if we choose to see uh, an advertisement or fall for an advertisement which uh, you know, says, hey, the cereal can create you a Superman, make you a Superman. So there are products like Apple, um, which if you, if you see advertisement, and talking particularly about Apple, advertisement, um, which make you feel like you're part of a revolution. Um, when Apple, the first Apple computer came out, and it was true, it was a revolution, and it changed the way world is, the world is today. Um, so, in essence, what I'm trying to say is, it's not technology or capital, capitalism what we, that is to blame, that is to be blamed here, uh, but rather our own choices. Well, I think that's completely false. I mean, you can't, you can't say capitalism is not to blame. I mean, that's just crazy. Um, you can have the idea that you know, we have the choice to participate in that, but what choice do you have? I mean, what does choice mean? How, can I opt out of capitalism? Where do I go? Um, beam me up, Scotty, I'm going to go to you know, the enterprise and where there is, you know, the, I mean, the great thing about Star Trek, right, is they're all communists. Um, and you can kind of just beam yourself up to planet communism. Well, you don't have that option. You can't get out of... I mean, the whole point of globalisation is that capitalism is everywhere, that there is nowhere that you can go. So it's completely false to say that capitalism is an individual choice. I choose not to choose capitalism, but I don't have any choice about that. Um, 
In terms of the technology, can you choose not to do it? Well, I would get sacked if I said to my boss, look, fuck it, I'm not dealing with the email anymore because I hate it. Um, they'd say, well, fine, go and get a job elsewhere. Um, so this idea of choice is completely false. Uh, and I think that we can't... We just buy into capitalism. If we, if we think we have individual choice, we are buying into what capitalism is telling us, which is that you have choice. You can buy a Mac, you can buy a PC. We don't care if you don't buy a PC, go and buy a car. Just buy something. Um, if that's all that choice means to us, then, then that is false. Um, and we have bought into an ideology that we should be wanting to resist. So, no, I don't agree. I don't think that, that we can simply say, you know, technology just enhances our existence. Yes, maybe it does. I mean, that's the point about technology, right? It's awesome, and I love it as much as anybody else, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be critical of it. Um, just one point yeah. like that. On the contrary, it seems that you set a great example by not opting for a PowerPoint which would be the preferred choice of many people. Small I mean, revolutionary act. Contrary to what you're saying. <laughs> Small revolutionary act. Yes. But still, it's, it's an example. Like, yeah. Contrary to all statements that you made, you opted for not going for a presentation, you opted for choosing a paper format, just talking to others. I think it's more on a choice-based thing rather than being influenced. Just for sure. For sure. Every, you know, ultimately, the revolution will come about through millions of people making choices. Um, the question is, where do those choices come from? Do they come from... Uh, a fully formed subject that come from uh, a subject that is formed in the image of capitalism or from somewhere else. But my point is that you as an individual cannot opt in or out of capitalism. It will have to happen collectively. Um, so if you look at the, we're talking about an iPhone, for example. Um, you have hundreds of apps. Um, I'm very, I love apps. Um, they track my eating habits, they track my fitness, how much I walk a day. When you're talking about opting out, of all of these notifications from all of these, these apps. What we are moving towards, I agree in the past, what was happening was you, you were bombarded by all these notifications. And when I talk about past, it's three years down the line, uh, three yeah. years before. What we are moving towards now, in terms of uh, the products that are coming in now, is you can choose to opt out of those notifications. It's a very simple function on your phone. You go to not notifications and turn it off. There's just one button you need to click and they're all gone. Sure. It, so what we are moving towards, is a world where you can choose. And technology is evolving in, in where um, it is giving you that freedom. There are okay, better products you, that are coming out. Let me give you a different example. I'm not talking about the phone, I'm talking about technology. So what I'm talking about is capitalism. So imagine that you have a disease. Imagine you have measles. And you think, I don't want these spots on my arm anymore because they're ugly. So you put some stuff over those spots. And you don't have spots. But you still have measles. And it will still kill you if you don't get treated. That's what capitalism is. Your phone is a spot on your arm. You think, oh, I opt out of it. I'll put some makeup over it and I can't see that spot anymore. But you still have the disease. So you can opt out of using this app or that app. I mean, all those apps are free market research for another company, right? Um, you're telling them what you eat so they can market that off to somebody else. Say, so this, you know, people of this cohort, this age group, this age, this kind of you know, income bracket, this is what they eat. So push that stuff at them as much as you can. Free market research, you're a slave. Um, but you, know, you cover that up, you still have the disease. So what I'm talking about is the disease. I'm not talking about phones. Phones are just a kind of way of getting you provoked. Um, but it's the disease that I'm really you know, kind of getting our head, heads around. Yeah. I think we can take one last question. I can. Just to I'd um, like further to elaborate on my idea. Um, do you think capitalism is um, part of our bodies? Do you think it is genetic now? Do you think it is, um, we need a molecular revolution? <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's what Guattari meant by molecular revolution, but maybe we need to go that and deep. how? How? I don't know. No, but that's the point about revolutions, right? Nobody knows when they're going to come, how they will come. Um, but or do you think, are you, would you define capitalism to be, to that extent, and like, uh, um, have such an influence on it? Sure. I mean, without you know exaggerating, if you think about a Western diet, which is uh, contains vastly more calories, vastly more sugar than we actually need, um, you know, research is beginning to demonstrate 
For example, um, the kids that eat way too much sugar, they can't concentrate in class because they're jittery all the time, so they have to then give them Ritalin to try to slow them down. So yeah, the very food stuff that we are creating and, and that we are eating is transforming our bodies and uh, ultimately transforming our minds. So yes, capitalism right down to the most, you know, to our DNA. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, may I request uh, Leon, Navjot, and uh